Yeah, it's a lot of cool. It's been about just over a week now since the album's been out. We've just kicked off the tour as well. It must yeah. be pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's good to be out of England, mm. to be honest with you. Um, it's good to be here. It's nice weather as well, so it's doing all right. Just sort of dawning on us um, how much work we've got to do now, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's good, though. It's a pretty fun on tour. Yeah, well, it's not, um, the way it's been put together, it's, I'm not really sure where we're going. I was having a little look at the itinerary before we came out. It doesn't really make much sense to me, but I know that, you know, I know we start here and we finish in England, and whatever goes on in between is whatever goes on in between. I'm not, not really sure about that anymore. But it seems to be loads, seems to be a lot of little tours, as opposed to, me. I mean, we do visit home quite a lot because of the, the kids and all that, so. Are they going to join you? No, 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 too young. Yeah. Mine's only five weeks old, so. Sure. Well, good bit of life-changing thing, really, eh? Well, no, uh, to be honest with you, three weeks after she was born, I left anyway, so... Yeah. It's, um... Didn't really get that much of a chance for it to... I mean, obviously, you know, it's your daughter and all that, and there's a... You know, there's a bond there, but... She's she not really got a personality yet. She does a lot of sleeping and that, so... Sure. Not really didn't get the time to get that attached to her, really. I was letting her, her mother do all the bonding first. I was, I was rehearsing, really, you know. Missing out on all the hard work. <laughs> yeah. All the smelly hard work, yeah. <laughs> I was just to say, how does it compare to, like, the start of the Be Here Now tour? Are you better spirits now? Um, can you work in, or...? Um, it's quite a daunting task, really, when starting off, I guess, isn't it? I think that the last time we took a lot of things for granted. I mean, before, before we'd even left Britain, we'd sold about a million and a half records. By the time we got to Japan, we'd done about four or something like that. Um, so this, you know, we're doing all right up to now, but it's, not, it's, it's in no way as big as it was like three or four years ago. Uh, so I think, you know, we'd, we're at a, it's a better vibe in the band because we're playing better on stage and we seem to hang out a little bit more and we're a lot more focused on what we have to do. Uh, but it looks like we're going to have to work a little bit harder to sell the records, that's all. Sure. But we don't, I mean, I know, I don't mind that. Sure. Uh, something, I'm not a musician, but um, yesterday's concert, to me and compared to the bootlegs I've got, it sounded pretty good. And We've got just... a new sound, man, you see. Oh, okay. See, the last time, uh, our sound engineer, he sort of lost the plot a little bit. Uh, it was maybe a little bit too loud for its own good, really, but we seem to have got this guy, this Australian guy called Bruce, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, very noisy, lorry, isn't it? It should be OK, then. Yeah, and um, he seems to have got the balance of the band great, and he seems to have been able to reproduce the sound of the, of, of the new record, which is... I mean, I don't personally know because I don't watch it from out front, but from what people have been telling me, it's great, so... Yeah. Was, yeah. 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 Well, I was to say, like, um, obviously, Andy and Gem, they obviously must have been aware of them coming out with Oasis, but not just that. Um, you, you know, to me, it seemed that you're having a bit more fun out there when you jammed, did the Led Zeppelin thing yesterday. And... Yeah. I mean, I, d I, don't, I don't really think... I don't really think that it does feel weird for them, really. Yeah. Because I think that we were so much part of... We were so much part of British culture anyway, and we were all on the same record label. It's almost like we've been in the same band anyway for a while. You know, it's not as if they're two complete and utter strangers from, you know, from, I mean, they're fucking good musicians, first and foremost, and they're great people. But they know, they know, they know a lot about the Oasis songs anyway, do you know what I mean? So, I dare say that we form a, a part of their record collections, do you know what I mean? So, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's that, I think it was probably weird and, being in rehearsals as opposed to being on, when you're on stage, you know, you're just playing to the crowd, aren't you? When you're in rehearsals, he's trying to get it right. Uh, we've been through all that now, and I think, you know, I think that, I think that by the time we get, I think usually the seventh gig is where it really starts to click, so it's the sixth gig tonight, and so the night after tomorrow should be a pretty good one. <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, all the gigs have been great apart from the one in Fukuoka where Liam lost his voice in that, which is a bit of a bummer, but. I mean, the doctor did tell him to rest for five days and he was singing two nights afterwards, so we can't really complain too much. That's, that's the top of Liam, actually. I, I, 
to talk about the studio, I mean, you've got to hand it to him. I mean, the band, the to the band did line a lot, I guess, how he acted and how, how he acted for what the album was going to be, and he didn't drink, and he did well for yeah. himself. And, so, I guess he wrote the news, he wrote a song as well. I mean, yeah. So. Well, he is looking after himself on the road as well because, you know, it's like there's too much at stake these days. If it was like three or four years ago, nobody really gave a fuck about anything, really. It was like we were the biggest band in the world, no one gave a shit. You know? Whereas now we've got too much to lose, really, so we can wait for the party until we get home. Well, it was the same in the studio as well, you know. So around right about the time of being now, we would all get pretty much... pretty loaded and then go and record a record, whereas... for this album, we sort of done it the other way around. But I like working like that anyway. I don't like chaos in the studio, because I can't concentrate on what it is I'm trying to do, you know. Just but, to lay this, sorry. But I, I think that the, be the record sounds better for it anyway. Yeah, definitely. Just to, just to lay this bone and gigsy thing to rest on, they were very important to the band before, just to the persona and everything. And it has been said that it's not so much as five Mancunians on the piss now. It's, it's like a normal band now. Like, yeah. It's like a pop entity now. Is, would that be fair comment? They are better well, musicians. Well, oh, oh, yeah, so. totally. I mean, in the case of... What it's done is it's Gemma's taken a lot of the weight off my shoulders because I don't have to play lead guitar all the time, so I can concentrate on singing and playing rhythm guitar a lot more than I would usually do. And Gwig's by his own admission, bless him, could never play the bass anyway. Yeah. Um, so, and he's a far better bass player, but... You know, it was like... They were right for the band at that time. But I don't think they were... I don't think that... I don't think it would be right if they were playing the... I don't know, it just, this just feels right, you know. And I think that if Bonin and Gwigs were still in the band, we wouldn't have been making another record after this. Because... It just become a bit stale for me. Yeah. Whereas now Andy and Gemma have joined the group. And it's sort of breathed new life into us, really. And I think that we can only see positive things for the future. Whereas if it was just like the same old shit, just touring the same old band, you know, it doesn't really hold much interest for me. Because it's like we don't really change that much musically. What comes out of the speakers is more or less, you know, it's more or less rock and roll music, give or take a few drum loops. But it's still, it's still, just still not five guys playing rock and roll, you know. So, so at least the personnel has changed. So at least the next time we go in the studio, that's going to be different. So, you know, it's all looking good from a personal point of view. Yeah. In a way, it would probably been easier for Bernard Giggs if had left before the album in the studio, right? So then maybe Gem and any feel a bit more part of it. Yeah. Well, it, well, it would have been, but you know, like I say, you know, these things are. These things are thrust upon you, and you just got to deal with them the best way you can. In, in an ideal world, they, they should have said before they left to go to France that they were thinking of quitting, and then we could have got somebody in. Yeah. But I don't think it would have made much of a difference to the record because I played all the bass on it anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. and most of the guitars. So I don't think you know. But I'm glad in a way that I'm glad in a way that you know that now we're going to go and write maybe write some songs together and as opposed to all the songs being written and them coming in and just playing on it. Yeah. It's going to be different when we go in the studio, because we, we haven't written any of the songs yet, so... I think the great thing now with the Four Oasis fans is, like, the future of the band would be here now. You never really knew what was going to happen. But at least now, and, and all the critics are talking about how important this album sells and this album really matters, the future of Oasis, but you're already talking about the fifth and sixth albums. It doesn't really... I'm, uh, yeah. I, I don't really like the... Yeah. See, the British press, they always talk about fucking sales figures and chart yeah. positions, and it's not about that. You know, it's like... You can, I mean, I, sometimes it gets me down. It's like, we were... You can look at this one or two ways. It's like, people say we were really lucky to have a big hit album with Morning Glory, but the way I look at it is like, we were really fucking unlucky because we've, we've, we've never been able to live that down ever since the day I wrote Wonderwall, man. You know, it's like, we sold 12 million albums once, you know. And people should be saying, you know, people should be great that a British band actually came that close to being as big as the fucking Beatles. But what it is, is they just use it as a stick to Beatles with, and it fucking gets on my nerves, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's never been about chart positions and sales figures. It's been about the fans, and if the fans like the record, and we make enough money, and we still have the enthusiasm after this seven-month tour to say, are we all still friends? Do we still want to make another album? And if the answer is yes, then it's, you know, it's a successful record. I mean, I don't care how much it sells. I don't really give a shit, you know. None of us do. 
to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I make good records, full stop. Well, you can't make people go on bike, can you? Just to go back, let's talk about the album now, actually, and talk about the live thing. I was, I was interested to see how people songs like Gas Panic and, uh, and Who Feels Love would be interpreted in the live stage. You did it quite well. Yeah. Have, have they been more challenging than the other songs? Because I was, the new sounds. Well, the one I was worried about, or the two that I was worried about the most, was Go Let It Out and Who Feels Love because of all the, the backward stuff and loops and stuff like that. Yeah. The main problem was convincing Alan to play, you know, to a click track. Because you're not into that at all. But you know, um, we had a few, we had a few sit-down meetings and chatted about it and said, look, you know, we've got to move this thing forward, even if it's only a little bit for the live thing, if anything. So I was worried about who feels love and go let it out. Gas panic's just a rock and roll. I wouldn't say it's just a rock and roll song, but once, well, once we convinced the drummer that you know to put a pair of headphones on is not you know, a betrayal of your talent, then he was fine with it. Um, so I think, I think, you know, I think that Sunday morning call and where did it all go wrong, just look after themselves and Gas Panic looks after itself. So I think it's a good set, to be honest with you. I would like to be doing some might say, but Liam just can't sing it anymore. I was, I was a bit about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a shame because that's probably the best Oasis song that we've got, that sort of, in that four and a half minutes, that's what it is, you know. It's just, that probably says more about Oasis than any other song. But, um, you know, he just can't, he can't sing the chorus anymore. And it's like, you know, if it means him walking off stage every time he sings it, then it's best just to do Shaker Maker. But, you know, the odd night will throw it in and it'll be extra special then, so. Yeah, I wanted to see how Gem and you got the guitars at the beginning. Yeah, well, we've done it, you know, it was good because we were sort of bouncing off each other, but, you know, so be it. We, we might have to, it might be, in a, it might be a case that in the future we might have to drop it down a couple of keys for him to sing it. But, you know, he's put so much into his singing over the last five or six years that his voice has just shot to bits, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. Is, is, he, um, uh, is he taking care of it? I mean, do you... Yeah, he's, yeah. he's taking, you know, he's, he's not smoking as much as he used to, certainly not drinking as much as he used to, and he goes to bed at a civilised hour now, like everybody else. Okay. Um, I think at first he thought that that was, uh, that wasn't a cool thing to do. But if you can't do your job, then you know, it's as simple as that. Because if he can't sing, then the band can't play. But it's all right me taking over and saying, oh, well, I'll, you know, well, I'll do the gig, but it then ceases to become Oasis, doesn't it? It then becomes the Noel Gallagher experience. You know, and that's, and that's not what it's all about. Let's go back to the album. Um, what were the most challenging songs in the album? Um, well, the most challenging one for me personally is the one I bottled out on, <laughs> which was uh, Roll It Over. When I got to the, to the middle bit, where there's the, uh, the guitar solo in, I couldn't think of anything to play whatsoever. And everything that, that I was playing was just a bit naff. Yeah. And uh, so I just gave up. And everyone was saying, well, we need a guitar solo. And I just passed it to my mate who was in the studio. And I said, look, you go play it. I can't play it. I mean, I can play it, but I just couldn't think of anything to write. So. He said, what do you want it to sound like? So I said, Pink Floyd. Yeah. So that's what he done. But I haven't got a problem with that, you know. As long as I write the songs, I don't give a shit who plays on them. But um, I was most happy about Who Feels Love and Go Let It Out and hear them coming out of the speakers, really. Because I knew exactly what I wanted in my head, but to try and articulate that to somebody else, like Spike, and then for him to push all the correct buttons and get it get it right coming out of the speakers was, was a challenge, I suppose, and so them two, really. But I'm proud of it all, apart from the lyrics on I Can See a Liar, which... That's uh, the only other uh, critics been really getting... Yeah, on. but I mean, I, you know, I, I said that before it came out, so, yeah. you know, I did warn everybody, so, uh, I mean, I'm not saying... I think it's a great song, but it's just, just the lyrics are a bit shit, but, you know, Liam wanted it on the album and I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I got outvoted in the studio sure. by, by the producer as well as the engineer, so there, but... You know, there you go. Bit of pictures of Lily, pictures of Lily, in that, in that. Well, that's yeah, a bit of pictures of Lily, bit of AC/DC, bit of the Sex Pistols. Yeah. I like it was, you know, it sounds like it was, uh, it sounds like what it is. It was a song that was, we were fucking about in the studio doing, uh, I don't know what we were doing, what song it was. And I was waiting for the tape to rewind, and I just played the riff, and everybody stopped and went, "What's that riff?" And I went, "I don't know." And they said, "Right, just get it down on tape. We'll write a song around it." I was like, well, hang on a minute. 
let's finish this what we're doing. So I wrote it really quickly and I maybe should have spent a bit more time on it, but you know. But the thing, the thing with, with songs like that, for every 10 people that say, you know, it's a bit shit, you know, there'll be five that say, oh, hang on a minute, that's my favorite song on the album. So the, the reviews that I've read of, of the album, you know, some people have said it's the worst song on the album, some said it's the best, so I mean, who do you trust? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> just while in the Who, just before I forget, I, mean, I was very glad to hear that you can do the cover of My Generation. Yeah. Because I've always seen Oasis more like the Who in terms of persona, got a lot of things in common, the in band fighting, Australia <laughs> thing, it's, it's, it's all yeah. there. Yeah. Um, it's, I always thought we were a cross between Slade and the Who anyway. Okay. I never did, never did get the Beatles thing. I think that all stemmed from a version of uh, I'm the Walrus we've done years ago and then it just carried on from there, really. Yeah. I don't even think we sound remotely like the Beatles. I think on two tracks, Whatever and All Around the World is the only time we've done the Beatles thing. Well, that's about it. The rest of it's all just, it's just rock and roll music. Just on the B-sides, so rock and share, that's about it. Yeah. yeah, or maybe the master plan is maybe a bit Beatles-esque, but... You see, but when, like... See, the thing that I don't understand is, you know, like... When, uh, when Radiohead put the little bit of Sexy Sadie in uh, Karma Police. Yeah. You know, everybody says that, you know, he's a genius. Now, when I put a little bit of Dear Prudence in Who Feels Love, it's called pastiche, you know what I mean? So, be honest. <laughs> people just don't honest. fucking like me anymore. I've done <laughs> something. I've done something and I can't quite work out what it is, but there you go. But of course, you'll find out that if you listen to everybody's music, especially British bands, there's always a little bit of the Beatles in there somewhere, but it's all, I just get caned for it all the time, which is a fucking, it's a pain in the ass for me, but. What can you do? Always the fans turn up. Yeah. yeah. So just go back to the live thing as well. <clears throat> How do you feel like singing the old songs like Rock, Rock and Roll Star and everything? I mean, because you have moved on. But I love like, it. Yeah. I think, to be honest with you, you know what the, the problem is? Even, well, because the last time we came out on the road in 97, we were doing eight songs off BA now. It was just fucking, it's just a ridiculous thing to even attempt to do. You know, it's like, I mean, we're doing five on this tour of the new album, and I think that's one too many, you know, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, see, because like, people want to come for it. I mean, people are going to buy your album. No, no one's going to come and pay. All these gigs were sold out before the album come out anyway. So nobody's coming along and they're thinking, well, I'll buy a ticket for the gig and I'll see what the new songs sound like and then maybe I'll go and buy the album. It's not mm. fucking about that with us, you know. It's like people want to come and they want to hear Don't Look Back in Anger and sure. Rock and Roll Star and Supersonic and Shaker Maker because it reminds them of five or six years ago when they met the girlfriend or when they got married or when they had their first child or something like that. You know, these are life-changing songs we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, so I think, I, think there's a, I think there's a duty to play them songs. I don't think, I don't think you should play too many new ones anyway. Especially if they're not as good as the old ones. <laughs> <laughs> the, the band will remain, remain unnameless, but they've actually said, a very famous British band, that they're not going to play any of their singles anymore. And like, I kind of think it will, I don't know, I mean, it's probably still going to be digging down great, maybe. Yeah. That is ridic that, yeah. That's just ridiculous. I mean, it'll be like, so what are they going to do? Play their new album every time yeah, they go out much, in yeah. order? Pretty much. It's fucking stupid. I mean, if you want to go and hear somebody's new album, right? Mm. You got the record, so you buy it, you put it on your stereo where it's nice and it's, you know, and you get a nice good sound out of it. Gigs are nights out. Gigs are things to get drunk to, jump up and down in the air to, you know. Uh, I think whoever that was, I don't know who you're talking about, but whoever it was, I think it's ridiculous. OK, I'm, uh, last time I spoke to you, and I knew you were just pissing around, but you told me that lyrics were rubbish and that the melody really counted. And mm. for the first two albums, that's certainly the case. Anyone who wants to see anything deep in the first two albums doesn't get it, really. Obviously now you have moved on, and lyrics, this is these are your deepest lyrics. Yeah. Well, I was you know, between the years of 1990, 91, and when I started to write this album, uh, I, everything in my life was going like that. You know, it was uh, got a record deal, was in a great band. You know. I met a great girlfriend who became my wife. Uh, sold shit loads of records, toured the world. And it was fine. It's really hard to write uh, decent lyrics about how happy you are. So that's been for me anyway. So I just make up abstract shit that sounded good. And that's, you know, that was my philosophy. Now, round about the time, in between the end of BA now and the beginning of this, writing of this album, I went through a pretty dark time with drugs and stuff. Yeah. 
And I've since found that it's very, very easy to articulate darkness than it is to articulate, you know, happiness. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's just, on this particular album, it's just, that, you know, they're just documents of what was going on in my life around about that time. Now, the stuff that I've been writing lately is very, very uplifting again, because I'm happy again now, because, you know, to me, I feel like I'm in a new band. And I can only see good things for the, you know, for the future. So, stuff I've been writing lately is up, is quite uplifting, uh, in its melody and its um, in the music. And I've gone back to the, I've gone back to where I was now in, you know, 1994. It's like I'm finding it really difficult to write, to write words again because, how do you articulate happiness? There's only one way to say it, and that is to say, I am fucking very happy. Whereas there's many ways to articulate sadness and darkness. So you're happy with you doing what you're doing then, obviously. This last yeah. time you said you were on equipment was 35, I can't see that happening now. I mean. No, I definitely, I don't... Like I say, if it was the same old band, mm. I probably wouldn't even be here now. I probably wouldn't even be bothered touring because it, I know it'd be shit. But I know I definitely want to make... See, we don't, we don't plan for anything, you know, like five years down the line, it's like, I know we're going to make one more record and then after that record we're going to tour that record. And after that, again, you know, who knows, you know. Who knows who's even going to be in the band then? I wouldn't... I know from my experiences in Oasis that after the next record, I wouldn't even bank on us having our own record label anymore. I wouldn't even bank on us having the same manager, I wouldn't even bank on us having the same drummer or rhythm section or singer or anything because from my experiences, with this fucking group, anything can happen. But there will definitely be another record and there will definitely be another tour. Depending on, I don't know how big that tour will be, it depends, you know, on how, you know, on how much money we make off this album, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, I can see two years down the line anyway, let's put it that way. Okay. Cool. So, say, um, uh, out of all the albums, this is a very understated album. And I, would you agree with that, firstly? I think that, it's a, in a weird way, it's a shame that, see, this, this, it's a shame that all this stuff has happened with Bonehead and Grease, because now this is, we've got to put a full stop after this record and say, well, that was the end of the first phase. Yeah. Whereas that should have really happened with Be Here Now, and this should be the beginning of the next phase, and I think it's a good starting point for the next, you know, for the next, it's a good indicator of where, well, because we had so much time off, we were just putting our foot back in the water, you know. And I was exploring a few things in the studio and a few things lyrically, and a few things within myself, you know. And during the making of the record, we found out that we were good at some things and not so good at others. We found out that we're not techno boffins. We found out that we're a fucking, we're a dirty rock and roll band and that's what we should remain. We found out that we're no good at, uh, at anticipating what modern thinking people like about rock and roll music. We found out that we're good at just plugging the guitar into an amp, turning the fucking thing up. As long as the song's good, that'll carry it through. Yeah. No amount of fannying about in the studio is gonna make, you know, some might say sound any better. It's a great song, period. Uh, so I think when we got to record the next record, it'll be done very, very quickly and there'll be a lot less fucking about. Okay. But you haven't moved on then, so. Yeah, but I think, you, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't dig all this bullshit about moving on sonically. We never said we were going to change the world. We never said we were going to, you know, make groundbreaking records. I don't give a fuck about British music or Japanese music or French music or the ongoing, you know, the ongoing fucking uh, challenge, you know, to challenge your listener. Fuck all that, man. I just want to make people dance, you know. I just want to move air, man. I don't care about fucking, you know, sonics and where music's going to be in the next century. I'm not going to be fucking around in the next century. I don't give a shit about that. And when did I ever say I was going to change music anyway? When did I ever say I was going to be this groundbreaking, you know, lyrically adept musician? Yeah. Fucking, I just play the blues, man. Just write bullshit. Sure. I was going to say, um, between Definitely Maybe and What's the Story, your songwriting, you, you were just cutting like, and, Mon and the master band, is, there, there you go, all these great songs are just coming out. Yeah. A lot of being now, My Big Mouth, long before it came out. Um, like, is this the first time you had to get to start from scratch? Yeah. So it was, yeah. That must yeah. have been quite daunting. Right? Um, what was 
It was because the the thing that the thing between definitely maybe and uh, be here now was like I never had any time off, so I was just writing constantly. But this time, after the BA Now tour, I didn't write any songs on that tour because I was too busy getting pissed. And uh, so I came back off the tour with nothing, not one single crotchet of music, and then I had a year off. And then didn't write anything for a year, so it was then, you know. So in effect, I hadn't written anything for two years. Now the thing about songwriting is, it's like anything, it's like riding a bike, you know. You just need to practice. You, you do forget how to do it, you know. You, you know, you've got your little methods of, you know, where do you go when you get stuck for that line? And all songwriters have got their little, you know, their little stack of books that they get out. We all do it. Um, so I'd forgotten how to do that, and it was, it was just a case of, that was, that was the most daunting thing, was writing the first song. Yeah. And the first song that I wrote was Let's All Make Believe, which is... Uh, and that was written, and if you listen to the lyrics of that, that probably gives you a good indication of why the band nearly broke up. Okay. And then it just went from there, really. Um, but yeah, it was quite a daunting prospect, but you know, at least I didn't, at least I haven't got pressure put on me by any record company or anything like that. I'm not, you know, it's never like, on this day you must deliver this album or you're in breach of contract or anything. People just let me get on with my thing, you know what I mean? I do come up with the goods. So I just need a bit more, you know, as I'm getting older, I just need a bit more space and time, really, just to get on with it. When, when did you decide to, that you were going to use Aaron Morris with um, Mark's tape was going to come in? When did you decide that, was it? And what were the uh, reasons behind it? Just that I thought we've, I felt we'd come to the end of the relationship with Owen, really. I didn't think that going in the studio and seeing Owen behind the desk, as much as I love him as a geezer and that, you know, and he's, we've done some great stuff together, I would know exactly what I was going to get out of him, and he would know exactly what he was going to get out of me. Whereas with Spike, I'd never met him before. So I was thinking, well, you know, who's this geezer? And he'd never met me before, and he was thinking, well, I wonder if all the stories are true about this geezer here now. So it was a case of uh, musical sparring for the first, you know, six or seven weeks of the album. And he's like, well, you know, well, this is what I do. And I'm like, yeah, well, anything you can do, I can do better, mate. So I think we pushed each other a little bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with him again. Um, but, you know, Owen was brilliant for that time. It was the same as Griggs and Bonner, they were great for that time, but, you know... Just, you know, shit's got to change every now and again, you know what I mean? Keep, keep, keep you happy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, go let it out, I've heard you talking about it. It's, it. It could easily have been on Definitely Maybe if it was going to be produced differently. Yeah. But that could be the last of its kind. Just, I don't know if you've been that, is that... Do you know what I mean? Wait till you hear the new stuff, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The I've written... Uh, I'm halfway through the third song of the next album. Mm. And so the two that I've written have got lyrics finished, demoed and everything, yeah. and they're just fucking absolutely rocking. One of them is the biggest glam rock track you're ever going to hear ever. It's got the biggest backbeat of a fucking song I've ever heard. The one after that is a proper Oasis anthem proper one and the one that I'm writing at the moment is just like filthy dirty stooges meets fucking Black Sabbath heavy rock um, but all all air punching anthems none of them are like you know it's more like that so um, let's just hope there's a fucking people around to listen to him <laughs> have you written anything with Gem or Andy yet? no um, Andy's written Andy's written a song that him and Liam are working on. Mm. But I think that's, uh, that's Andy's song. Mm. Gem was doing something in the dressing room the other night and I flipped him a couple of chords. Uh, so, you know, but you can't, you know, I don't think, you can't force these things. I think that it's just going to be after, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, you know. I don't think they'll be put in the diary, you know, oh, today I must write a song with Gem and Andy. But I know for a fact what happens when five geezers get in, a, get, get, you know, when you get in a recording studio, and all the guitars are laying around, the drum kit's there. Shit happens. You know, it just so happens that for the past eight years, every time I've gone in the studio, it's just been me there. The rest of the band they don't express any interest in songwriting. But, um, you know, Andy and Gunwell, I know they will. So, I think that, I think that something, let's say, say it's only one song that's a B-side, that's a good thing, you know. And say if Gem only writes 
two songs by himself. And say they don't even go on the album. It means that I don't have to write two B-sides, it might go on the album after that, do you know what I mean? So, it's all good. It's all good. It's got to change tapes with it. Promise you that. You have a difficulty conveying in words what you really want to say in a song. And I, I, would you have been able to write this, this album two years ago, lyrically, I'm talking about? No. Yeah. I feel, with my songwriting, it's very, it's very, with the lyrics anyway, it's very hit and miss, you know, but I have to say in my own defence that Slide Away, Cigarettes and Alcohol, Live Forever, off the first album are just fucking fantastic lyrics. I don't give a shit what anyone says. And Supersonic, and it's just, it's utter stu stupidness. It's just fantastic. Now, on um, Morning Glory, Cast No Shadow has got fantastic lyrics. Yeah. Um, the rest of the lyrics on that album, they work as a musical instrument. On Be Here Now, none of them have got any good lyrics, apart from maybe Magic Pie, and that's about it. But you know, when I'm good, I'm good, and you know, I, you know, I have to say, I'd have to say to these bands, you know, they're all, they're all, all these young, these young fucking guitar bands in England, they're always slagging me off, and I always just say, look, fuck off, go and write Live Forever, then fucking come back and let's talk about it in five years. You know, go away and write a B-side like the Master Plan, and then come and talk to me about your lyrics. Go away and write a song about Wonderwall, you know what I mean, that changes people's lives all around the world, and come back and talk to me about lyrics. You know, I'm allowed to slag my lyrics off, you know, they're not, man. All these little pups in these bands are like, yeah, you can't fucking write lyrics. It's like, yeah, but, you know, it's a good job that I can't, because if I was, a, if I, if I was any fucking good, I'd be bigger than John Lennon. You're fucking lucky I'm not, do you know what I mean? I'd be the biggest star that I ever fucking was. It's a good job I'm shit. I remember the last album, the only one song, I, there wasn't a Don't Look Back in Anger on the last album, and Sunday Morning Call is, I think it is. Do you find the ballads easier to write than the high-tempo numbers? Um, do, um, I don't, I don't find, I find each song equally, you know, I don't really like, you know, I can't say I like up-tempo songs or slow songs. I, I do find, I do tend that I find to write more slow pieces of music, which I've now started not to bother recording anymore because I want to keep Oasis like a, you know, a high energy rock and roll band really. Um, but I do find it easier to write slow pieces of music it's just because I'm, I'm quite a laid-back geezer and when you've got an acoustic guitar, I'm not very fucking angry about stuff, you know. Mm. I just tend to be quite plaintive and write songs like that, but... So I've got a lot of slow music knocking about, which I'm not even going to bother exploring. You know, I'll just stick it on a cassette somewhere and I'll probably use it for solo stuff in the future. Mm. But it just depends what mood I'm in, you know, to be honest with you. Yeah. But in the case of Don't Look Back in Anger, I think that was... I don't really think that was that difficult to write. As long as I get the first line, I'm all right, I'm away. Getting the first couple of lines is the most difficult thing. But um, it's only just dawned on me, when we're going talking about that song, how good that fucking song actually is, since we've come back out on the road after three years. When you get to that, that's, you know, I mean, I know, to be honest with you, we always used to start in a different way. We used to start with this big fucking electric guitar, and it was just like, we used to play it too fast, and it was, you know, it was all over the fucking place. Yeah. From what the stuff we've done now, as soon as you hit that piano intro, the place goes fucking ballistic. I mean, the first night we've done it on the first, yeah, in Tokyo, it's like, you know, it's like, bloody hell, man. It's a fucking good song. Even though the lyrics don't really mean anything, do you know what I mean? It's just the feeling of it, you know. Your voice has never sounded better, actually. Well, I've, you know, I've taken a lot. I mean, it, the main thing to look for is see how many amps I'm not using. You know, on the last tour, I was using four Marshall stacks. Yeah. I was using, it was, just, it was just outrageous, you know. I wanted to be Pete Townsend. Whereas now I've got two little tiny amps. And I used to have them sort of like, you know, these big stacks. I used to have them backed up right against my back so I could, you know, so I could feel it. Now I've got two little amps and they're, they're across the side of the stage. I can actually hear what I'm singing now, yeah. you know. Um, and that's why, I, you know, it's, I just think that we had to, you know, sit down and rethink the whole life thing. And we were like, you know, because we always had it in our heads that we were the loudest fucking rock and roll band in the world. You know, it was just youthful bullshit, really. But the singing was always suffering, you know. So I think that, you know, it's better than it's ever been live-wise, I think. Last time we had Stay Young and Going Nowhere. And as with any recent album, it's a B-side, um, which I look forward to as well. Which one stand out? We've got Lesser Make Believer, he talked about that, Sickness and Hell, which 
Anything else coming up? Yeah, there's a track called One Way Road, which everyone seems to like. Yeah. Again, it was another one that was just... Have you heard it? No. There was another one that, that, that was made up in the studio, mm. but um, it's another coming off drug song. Mm. Well, it's quite, it's quite uplifting. Again, it's very slow and it's quite country-esque, mm. but it's a fucking great song. Um, and there's, there's a version of Hell Skelter, which we recorded back in 1996, yeah. which we just got around to mixing the tapes for, which is a bit... It's very much old Oasis does the Beatles. There's a track called Carry Us All, which is... Uh, it's not got very many loud guitars on it at all. It's a good song, but it's not a very good version, if you know what I mean. But so, I mean, I, I, some of the B-sides for this particular record are great. I think, I think, I think Let's All Make Believe in Cigarettes and Hell are fucking brilliant songs. Um, I don't know what's on the next single now, to be honest with you. But I think out the ones coming up, One Way Road is probably the best one. Also, um, I can see your songwriting involving. You're a big Neil Young fan, I know. Oh yeah. You've always had a big social concert as well. You were a big support of Old Labour. Um, yeah. And their Dockers concert as well. Mm. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that, you know, kind of songs pop up in the next album. Well, yeah, the thing about now, I'm sort of straight and sober. Mm. You know, and the, you know, you spend a lot more time watching the television. You spend a lot more time reading newspapers, and you do spend a lot more time. I wouldn't say worrying about what's going on, but you're more of aware of what you know, of what's going on. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we were, I was living in a, you know, I was living in a plastic bag that was just full of fucking Charlie and booze for the last 14 years, really, if I'm being honest. And I started taking drugs when I was, you know, just left school. I thought, no, I don't know. And it's just like, so, but it's not something that I would, you know, I mean, I'm not Bobby Gillespie, you know what I mean? I don't really give a shit about the state of Britain, to be honest with you. No. I said it... I mean, I, I think, for me personally, cigarettes and alcohol says, says more about the state of Great Britain than any song any punk rocker ever wrote. You know, because it's just a song about how it actually is, you know. Just want a little ghetto blaster and a bottle of cider and a fucking packet of cigs, and that'll be my favourite song and that'll fucking do me. Um, but I, it's, it's not something I would go out of my way to make a political statement, but if I was feeling political on that day, yeah. maybe it would. But I see another thing is, in England, you know, we all got the government we wanted. See, as much as, as, much as Labour are, seem to be all bent on fucking it up for themselves, I don't think anybody really hates them as much as they hated the Tories, who were just fucking right-wing twats, do you know what I mean? Um, so here's hoping Labour get voted out, and you know, we get a government that we hate, you know what I mean? <laughs> think that's, well, I think it keeps you young, doesn't it? Yeah. Because I fucking hated the Conservative Party. I mean, I still do, you know. And I would outlaw the and the royal family. And I'd outlaw the fucking lot of them. But whether I put it in the music or not, I don't know. Mm. Just wrapping this up. It seems to me now that you can finally smell the roses. Really. I mean, regardless of the album's doing fine and, and the stadiums are going to be full and Wembley said himself, you're okay. But you know, you really are. Um, what have been the highlights? Obviously, Nebworth we won. But what of the whole thing? Everything. Yeah. Uh, we've started at the beginning. Um, Meeting Alan McGee, mm -hmm. writing, writing the song Live Forever. I remember the night I wrote it and I put the guitar down and I just thought, well, this is it now. Yeah. From the point I wrote that song, it seemed that every song I was writing was just fucking brilliant. So there was that. Um, getting phoned up one afternoon. It's only 25, I've been told I was a millionaire. Yeah. You know, little things like that. Uh, Recording Morning Glory in two weeks for about 65 grand and it's selling 12 million. Uh, playing Madison Square Gardens, playing Main Road, playing Nebworth. Um, just, you know, all of it. But when I look back, I think, you know, a lot of people slag us off for a lot of things, but, you know, we came fucking that close, man, to being, you know, to being as big as the Beatles. It was only that close. If we'd have put out a decent third album, you know, say if this was our third album, I think you'd have been talking about major league fucking rock and roll stars, man. But, you know, shit happens and we lost the momentum. A lot of things got in the way with drugs and booze and stuff like that. In, in band fighting, fucking bullshit. 
you know, record company bullshit. But at least I can look back and I can, you know, I can look any musician in the eye and say, how close did you get? You didn't even get from here. It's as far as you can fucking see away. But I came that close, man. And it was scary. It was scary to think, man, that, you know, we played 125,000 people two nights on the trot. How fucking bizarre is that? You know, when I think about it now, it's just... And we didn't give a shit. You know, we turned up there fucking just pissed at ass. Show me the stage, I'll go and play. Like, if I'm playing to 25,000 people, I get nervous now. Do you know what I mean? We didn't give a fuck. Um, I think I look back on it and, and, and think, it's a good job that we didn't give a fuck. Because we probably have more grey hairs than I've actually got now. You know, we just didn't give a fuck. You know, but, you know, we've... Like I say, we've done our bit, man. We've done our bit. The Smith's done their bit, the Rosie's done their bit, the Sex Pistols done their bit, the Jam done their bit. And the Beatles done their bit. Who else is going to do their bit? I don't fucking see it at the moment. You know, I think we should just be left alone now to make some great music and just grow old gracefully. Whereas, you know, people, I think people in England will always want us to be Liam and Noel, fucking Ian, who fucking wants it, cunt face, you know. Um, but I'm 32, you know, by the next time I put out a record, I'm going to be 35. I just people just let me get on with fucking, you know, just being a man, I'm not a boy no more. Um, you know, I'm good at what I do, let's just leave it at that. I was great. I might be great again. Who knows? And the last question. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, they had Chuck Berry and Little Richard. How much did you listen to Little Richard and Chuck Berry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Little Richard and Chuck Berry go straight through to Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. You know, I don't know. It's all just the blues in it at the end of the day, but you know, and it all goes back, all goes back to to Mississippi in some way, doesn't it? You know, if it wasn't for, well, if it wasn't, for, you know, for black geezers playing guitars, they invented rock and roll, didn't they? Because it, you know, because Elvis Presley sold it to the white kids, you know, who then sold it back to the American white kids. We then bought shitloads of it. And then, you know, then we came along. And we're still buying it. But, uh, yeah, you know. Well, Steve Jones was my Chuck Berry. You know. And, um, uh, don't know who my little Richard was, though. <laughs> Pete Townsend, was it? Oh, Pete Townsend, yeah. I mean,. If we're talking purely guitarists, then, you know, it goes Steve Jones, Pete Townsend, John Squire, Johnny Marr. Um, definitely. I would all, just as a guitar player, I would love to be a cross between them four or five. I don't think, you know, I don't, I, probably to their own admission, John Lennon wasn't really the greatest guitarist in the world. He was a fucking brilliant songwriter. George Harrison was a little bit overshadowed by the songs to be considered a great guitarist, even though he was. Eric Clapton's fucking awful. Uh, Jimi Hendrix is just too good. And Keith. Keith, well, Keith, I put Keith in the same in the same bracket as Steve Jones. You know, it's like quite limited to what they do, but they just make it work for them. You know, what did Keith Richards say? Five strings, one finger, three chords, and one asshole. You know, that's all you need, man. And uh, but that's yeah, my guitar playing. That but. But yeah, I admire Keith Richards. I admire all them geese. You know, they're still doing it, aren't they? I mean, I went to see I went to see the Who at Ships Bush Empire just right. before Christmas. Yeah. And all these other young guitar bands are wasting their fucking time. I'm telling you, man, they're wasting their fucking time. The Who were fucking incredible. And then you talk to some knobhead who's got a keyboard fucking set up at home and he's a DJ and he's going, mm, he's fucking old farts playing music and you just go, hey, fuck face, whatever your name is, fucking Nicky F or fucking Danny Z or whatever your name is, man, suck your own ass. You know, they still got it. Can't fucking write songs no more, but they can still do the business, you know what I mean? Roger Daltrey can still sing anyway. That's it. Thank you very much. That's one. Just get a quick idea this is for an hour special. Yeah. I'm Noel Gallagher, make sure you watch the Channel V Oasis special. All right. Hiya, this is Noel Gallagher from Oasis, and make sure you watch Channel V for our one hour special.